Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to our fourth and final construction and engineering webinar of 2023, which is our winter update. And uh, we're bringing this presentation um, for members of the Chartered Institution of Civil Engineering Surveyors. Uh, my name is Stefan Harris Wright. I'm a partner in the construction and engineering team at Burkitt Solicitors. Um, many thanks indeed to the CICES for inviting us to uh, present this session to you this morning and uh, regular viewers amongst you will know that we've done quite a few of these sessions for the membership over the years and uh, always very happy to do that and, uh, and grateful to be uh, invited back. If we could have the next slide please. So hopefully most of you will have heard of Burkitt's before, but just in case you haven't, there's some information at a glance for you on this slide in case you want to um, have a look through that uh, for your information afterwards. But uh, just briefly, kind of in summary, we're a full service top 50 um, law firm with six offices across the UK in the east of England, London and in Kent. And as part of our organisation, we've got a specialist team of uh, construction and engineering lawyers who advise on both transactional and uh, contentious construction matters. If we could have the next slide, please. So I wanted to take the opportunity now to briefly introduce you to our speakers this morning. So I've got with me Emma Chiaramello, who's a senior associate in our construction and engineering team. Uh, we've got a guest speaker from another team, Sasha Wooldridge, Sasha's a partner in our immigration practice and also joined by Stephen Williams. Stephen's a solicitor in our construction and engineering team specialising uh, in advising on construction disputes. So a very warm welcome to all of our panel who you will hear from during the course of the session. If we could have the next slide, please. So just briefly to summarise what it is we're going to cover in terms of content for this morning's session. So first up, Emma's going to give an update on um, a really landmark piece of new legislation in the UK, which is the Building Safety Act. Um, Sasha's going to give us an update on immigration law as it applies to the construction sector. Very, very hot topic indeed. Um, and then Stephen's gonna wrap things up with his usual update on recent interesting construction and engineering cases. And then we're gonna have a QA. and a um, The panel will come back and join me at the end. There'll be an opportunity um, for you to put your questions through to our panel using the uh, the question sort of drop down or, or or function on the go to webinar portal that we're using this morning. Um, just to let you know, the questions come through to me and the panelists, uh, and not to delegates more widely. So you will remain anonymous. So please don't be shy. Feel free to to send your questions through to me. Um, we've had quite a few questions in advance as well, which is great. So thanks for those. Um, it's been a really good turnout for this morning's session, actually. So uh, I can't promise we'll get through. All of the questions but we'll certainly do our best to do as many of them as we can and then I'll look to draw proceedings to a close promptly by midday. Just a couple of other quick housekeeping points. Um, a copy of the slides will be emailed to all delegates after the session and also the webinar is being recorded and will be added to the CICES YouTube channel um, afterwards. If we could have the next slide. So without further ado I will hand you over to Emma for her update on the Building Safety Act. Emma. Can you hear me okay? Thank you, Stefan. Um, so I'm going to have a, a chat with you this morning about the Building Safety Act and some recent um, developments on that. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So just by way of a, an introduction, obviously this um, huge um, wide ranging piece of legislation has arisen out of uh, the Grenfell tragedy in um, 2017 and the inquiries arising out of that. And really the issues identified have been born out of the, the failures in the market to, to regulate itself. So this legislation is the government stepping in and um, regulating the industry in regards to structure one fire safety. The Act received royal assent in April 22, and it's the biggest reform in building safety regulation for a generation. Um, it's, it's, it's huge, really. Um, we've got 12,500 multi-occupant buildings, and 88% of them are higher risk buildings. The Act applies to all buildings, not just high risk buildings, 
but really the focus is on those higher risk buildings and the general definition for those um, is um, if they're 18 metres or seven storeys um, high or more and there needs to be a resident of more than one residential unit um, so yeah so they will be the, the the focus buildings if you like the higher risk ones um, the regime has a number of um, new words, new terminologies that people need to get their head round, and one of them is the, uh, the role of the duty holder. Um, and the obligation under the Act is that duty holders must take all reasonable steps to reduce the risk of fire spread or structural failure. And that's not just reasonable steps, that's all reasonable steps, which is um, obviously much more onerous. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So really these um, provisions, they were updated, uh, they were um, they're coming into force incrementally. Um, certain parts of it came into force in April of this year and more parts of it came into force in October of this year. Um, it's a really ambi ambitious piece of uh, leg uh, legislation and it's setting up a whole new scheme for high risk buildings. So in April 23, they set up the new regulated regime and, and introduced the, the new terminologies and required that existing high risk buildings be registered on the HC portal by the end of September, ready for the changes due in October. So from October, the um, Building Safety Regulator, which is part of the HSE, started its review of existing registered high risk buildings and started their um, risk assessments of those and it actually became an offence um, to to own a high risk building um, that wasn't registered. Um, registration for new build high risk buildings is, is has opened since 1st of October um, and the new gateway system has started with the building safety regulator effectively stepping into the, the shoes of building control for any high risk buildings. We've got a new competency framework and there's much more focus on enforcement powers. Um, essentially, the regulator is going to be using um, carrots and sticks, if you like, to, to ensure that everybody buys into to the, to the culture change really introduced by this Act. Next slide, please. So the building safety regulator um, will apply the regime for high-risk buildings, whether it's an existing or a new high-risk building, or um, if it's if you're doing works that are turning the building into a high-risk building. So they would all be um, within that, that regime. Um, whilst there's duty holders roles for all buildings, really the, um, the, the new re regime is for those 18 metre plus seven storey high and um, high-risk buildings. And the, the regulator is starting its process of assessing, inspecting and certifying those registered high risk buildings. They'll be doing you know, on site inspections and interventions, assessing what further information they need in relation to that building, um, in relation to new, new builds or, or works to turn a building into a high risk building. They will be involved through the change control process um, and they set their own inspections to schedule really. Um, so, as I said, from the 1st of October, it's an offence to allow occupation of an unregistered high-risk building. Um, the review of registered high-risk buildings has started. New build high-risk buildings can be registered and BSR is building control for those buildings. Next slide, please. I should mention as well that the building safety regulator is um, creating and taking steps to maintain its register of approved officers and it's not going to be permissible now for developers to use a private um, company to, to take on that role. Um, we've got three gateways moving forward so in the planning prior to starting construction and pre-occupation the main one we're focused on really at the moment is, is pre-construction um, Certainly there's, there's transitional provisions that apply and you don't need to go through gateways two and three if um, you know, you've got your planning consent by the 1st of October this year and you've made sufficient progress in terms of foundations, permanent foundations by April 2024. 
so you won't need to go through the pre-construction and pre-occupation phase. You do, however, need to give some thought to change control um, and if, you know, generally, um, if there's any changes that, that make, um, have any impact on structure or fire safety, then you need to factor in delays um, as the building safety regulator will, will be looking to review those and approve them. Next slide, please. So the focus is on duty holders, and that applies to all buildings now, not just high risk buildings. And who are they? They're the, they're the client, they're the designers, they're contractors, and they're everybody involved, really, and they all need to take all reasonable steps to, to ensure the building that's built is safe. Um, there's a big focus on competency. We've got this new competency framework. It's been modelled on CDM, which in some ways is, is quite comforting because duty holders could perform their roles under, under both uh, duties. Um, we need to be able to demonstrate for any um, building control applications that you know all the systems that we need to be competent, to ensure our duty holders are competent, are in place, that we've allocated sufficient time, resource and, and people to what we're doing and that our duty holders are properly trained and cooperating with each other to ensure that a thorough approach to, to fire and structural safety is, is being adopted. Um, at completion, the, the regulator will review all the um, as-built information and really we need to produce and provide evidence that that the building meets the functional requirements of the um, building regulations. We need to be able to demonstrate how the building complies. I should mention that trainees and apprentices, uh, apprentices can't be duty holders and they will need to be supervised. Next slide, please. In regard to resident stakeholders, that is obviously a big focus now and consultation of stakeholders um, and engaging them um, is, is a key a, a key focus and we need to have processes in place and clearly registrate, registering the building is the first step to giving those residents conf confidence that their building is safe to occupy um, but the actual certification process which has now started um, with the higher, highest risk buildings getting priority and all of that will bring greater confidence to those uh, residents. Um, and following on from the, pro cert the certification process, that, that certificate has to be displayed in a prominent position and it's an offence not to do that. So each building needs to have an accountable person and there'll be a principal accountable person as well. And generally that's the, the owner, the landlord, the management company, etc. cetera. Um, and that should already be underway. And they need to set up a risk management strategy and practical plan. And to get the building signed off and approved, they need to be creating their safety case report and carrying out any mandatory occurrences reporting. They need to have a plan in regard to how they're going to engage with resident stakeholders and show them how their building is being managed and maintained. Next slide, please. So since October, we have had um, much more focus on the regulator's enforcement powers. Um, they're, they're certainly stronger. There's several corporate and individual offences now. Um, and that is um, by any officer of a company, not just legal directors. Um, so the regulator can prosecute for obstruction, prevention, providing false or misleading information, and not registering, um, occupying without certification or not uh, displaying the necessary information like certificates. And the fines are unlimited and, and it is possible to go to prison for up to two years. So the offences um, are spread all over the Act, but you'll see the references there to the, to the relevant sections if, if you want to have a look. And clearly the, the regulator is not going to be able to get out and, and give all these sanctions from day one. Um, I think resources is, is, is a big issue and they've got this side focus on really educating the industry um, at the outset and making sure everyone knows what they're, they're supposed to be doing. 
um, and encouraging compliance with the regulate with the regulations and making sure everyone buys into it. Um, so the approach really is is offering carrots and sticks to to get everybody to to comply. Next slide, please. So what can we do to prepare? Um, look at how our people systems and data storage are set up. You know, what else do we need to be able to comply with this regulations? Noting that this this act, noting that nothing really has changed. It's just that um, it's really forcing everybody to take much more responsibility for it and ensuring that the, the building safety regulator has more control over structural and fire safety and everybody buys into ensuring that, that what gets built or what is built is, is properly built and maintained. Um, in regard to trainees and um, other staff, are they getting all the appropriate training to fulfil the competency requirements under the competency framework? Um, is it clear within your organisation who is accountable for what, who are the duty holders? Um, they need to know that the, the responsibility is on their shoulders. Um, external, externally, we need to be able to communicate that we're you know, able to fulfil those duty holder roles. Um, we need to consider as well whether we're adequately insured for what we're doing, noting that you know, under this Building Safety Act, there's there's been amendments to the um, to limitation periods for under the Defective Premises Act um, and the Building Safety Act as well. Um, and you've now got 15 and 30 year liability periods. So where you've got typical requirements to insure for six or 12 years, that there's a gap there that that you need to consider how how you're going to fill. Um, so. Another key thing to ensure everybody understands is that is the new terminology. So duty holders, accountable person, competency, and stakeholders, and what are you doing to ensure everybody knows about that, that terminology and what they need to do to prepare themselves. Next slide, please. In regard to um, any um, assets, any any buildings you own. We need to be ensuring that all the, the, the relevant paperwork for fire and structural safety um, is collated. That's known as the golden thread of information. Um, if we have any gaps in the knowledge about assets, we need to identify and close them and get third party help in doing, doing that if necessary, surveys and the like. Um, if we have a portfolio of, of properties, we need to be prioritising the, the highest risk ones first, which is what the regulator will do. For each occupied high risk building, we need to have a accountable person in place. There needs to be resident engagement. We need to be starting our risk assessments and communicating with, with residents. But really, the priority is making sure we're registered. Any new, new developments are registered from now um, and that you're able to show the regulator that um, you're taking steps. Next slide, please. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Sasha Waldridge now, who's going to give you an update in regard to immigration matters. Thank you very much, Emma, and hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much to uh, Stefan and the team for inviting me to, to join this webinar today. Um, so um, slightly off piece maybe, but I just wanted to talk to you and take a moment to talk about probably quite a key topic, um, which is how you can recruit and retain international workers in the sector. We know uh, industry is struggling to fill lots of vacancies at the moment due to a shortage of applicants, of skills in the UK, and more and more we're seeing businesses and organisations look to international workers um, to fill those gaps. So I'm going to give you a few of the highlights um, about what's changing in this area. Um, and to maybe give you some some pointers as to things to be thinking about um, if this is affecting you and your organisation. So if we can just move to the next slide, please. So um, 
I obviously not had the opportunity to speak to many of you before. So kind of starting um, at really at the beginning is that, um, you know, since Brexit and the end of the transition period um, out of the EU, um, then the UK has moved to a points based system. So you probably have heard about this mentioned in the press or if anyone's mentioned an Australian points based system that we've modelled ourselves on, um, then then that's what we are working to. And effectively, that is a regime whereby if you want to bring international workers into the UK, the current government have a prior, uh, a preference for a system where um, individuals are sponsored in some form to come to the UK and for their visas. So for many, that might be students are sponsored by their university, individuals might be sponsored by family members, but largely when it comes to workers, it's necessary that they're sponsored by their employers in, in order to secure a visa to work in the UK. So it's really quite tricky for anybody to apply for a visa independently to come to the UK. Um, and we are seeing businesses of all sizes. It used to really be um, limited to very large businesses that would sponsor visas. And now we're seeing startups, um, you know, one man band sort of size businesses now having to engage with the immigration system in a way that they haven't done previously. Um, now, despite that, um, and there is in some respects more administration required to um, in recruiting international workers now with the end of freedom of movement, um, there is a benefit in that now all nationalities are treated tre treated equally. There's the same visa application process for all nationalities and, and regardless of what country somebody's coming from to relocate to the UK. Um, so now organisations that are going through the sponsorship process, and I'll talk in a minute about what the eligibility requirements are to be sponsored. Um, but I think one benefit and a concern that businesses have is what if I sponsor a visa for someone, can they go and work for someone else? And the good news is that largely speaking, no. Um, if you sponsor a visa for someone, they can only really work for you in the role that you've recruited them for. Um, so you have got some surety that if you're going to commit to an applicant, uh, the cost of a visa, that they are going to, the, the stickiness there, that they're going to continue working with you for the foreseeable future. Um, now, previously, in, in times gone by, there used to be what we called a resident labour market test. Uh, for anyone that's engaged with that before, it was whereby you couldn't recruit an international worker unless you'd gone through a month long process of advertising a role to check that there was no suitable British applicants um, to take that position. So I did just want to update you that um, that used to be quite off-putting where lots of organisations would previously have headhunted candidates for a position. Um, and there is now a benefit to the new system whereby you've got no obligation to proactively prioritise British national applicants over other um, nationalities that might apply for the role. Um, so headhunting is much easier uh, if you need to sponsor a visa than it was previously. And in addition, the new immigration system is far more open than it was previously, recognising that we previously relied a lot on freedom of movement and EU workers to fill potentially lower skilled roles. Um, now, there's far more roles that are eligible for sponsorship. So the minimum skill level um, to sponsor someone is now an RQF level three. So that's equivalent to an A level. Um, in the UK of experience, whereas previously you could only sponsor visas for people doing a role at a degree level or above. One thing I also wanted to say is for, for this industry, of course, obviously knowing that you work a lot with apprenticeships, um, it's not necessary that somebody's got a physical paper qualification to meet that requirement, but only that in your recruitment process, you've assessed their experience and their on the job performance to know that they're performing at about that level in order to sponsor them. Um, so generally speaking, a much more open system than there was before, albeit I say for EU nationals, they're now subject to a visa system that they weren't previously. Um, now, in particular for the sector, I wanted to highlight um, that the Home Office just this summer have added a lot of extra immigration concessions to make it easier for the sector to sponsor certain workers. So the UK has what we call a shortage occupation list, and that's where the government have recognised that there is a shortage of particular talent in the UK, particular skill sets. There's lots of engineering roles already on that shortage occupation list, civil, mechanical, electrical engineers. Um, etc are all already on that shortage occupation list but the government have since the summer recognized that there's a real shortage of people in roles such as bricklaying masoners roofers carpenters plasterers um, and generally any other any other construction trade so there's a real recognition that the industry is struggling to fill gaps 
Um, now, the shortage occupation list, it isn't mandatory for a role to be on there for you to be able to sponsor in that position, but it's just to let you know that if you have got a role that you're sponsoring a visa for that isn't one of those shortage occupation list roles, you will get the benefit of there being a slightly lower visa application fee and also the minimum salary that you have to pay a worker to be eligible to apply for a visa is lower where there's a recognised shortage occupation. So um, there's a bit of a concession there, again, to make it easier. But I do want to be clear that now there's lots and lots of roles that are eligible for visa sponsorship that perhaps weren't previously, but a role doesn't have to be the short, on the shortage occupation list in order to be eligible for sponsorship. It's just that if it's on the shortage list, there are some benefits and concessions there for you to rely on. So if we go to the next slide, um, just as a canter through to talk about how do you check that a worker or a candidate that you're looking to employ is going to be eligible for sponsorship. Um, and key criteria to think about is, first of all, really, you should only be sponsoring a direct employee um, of yours. So you can't really sponsor contractors or self-employed persons. Um, so they must be working for you directly. There is a minimum salary applicable to be eligible to sponsor. So typically that's 26,200 per annum or £10.75. There are some concessions available if people are younger and there's a recognition that people are new in industry under the age of 26 may have a lower salary tariff. Um, it was reported in the press at the weekend that that minimum salary may rise to £30,000 per annum, but probably given the current labour market, you may well find that you're paying those sorts of salaries anyway. Um, so perhaps salary isn't um, too much of a barrier to visa sponsorship uh, as it might have been in days gone by. The skill level I've already talked about, so it must be an RQF level three, so an A-level equivalent skill level. Um, and one thing that sometimes I have seen cause some challenges in the industry is that any applicant for a visa must meet the English language proficiency in all four um, elements. So they'll have to sit an exam and they'll have to do that in speaking, reading, writing and listening. Um, so occasionally I see people that are really fantastic at speaking and listening, but sometimes, you know, the horrors of British grammar, English grammar, um, can make passing that test a little tricky. Um, so just to, to bear that in mind that not all candidates will will pass that and therefore won't be eligible for sponsorship. One thing I did want to mention really is that the UK immigration system is one of the most expensive in the world. So because we don't have a cap on visas anymore, there's no quota um, and the eligibility criteria are quite broad, the Home Office use the cost of visas um, and add extra tariffs on them to make that the deterrent against sponsoring um, work visas unnecessarily. So just to highlight, there's a works example on the screen there. But if you're sponsoring someone for a five year visa to come and work in the UK, the cost for that from January that next year is going to be as much as twelve and a half thousand pounds. And that's for an individual worker. If you're going to sponsor to bring in a family of four, you're looking at probably the best part of twenty thousand pounds. So they are very expensive. But again, that might be a good investment if you're really struggling to fill um, gaps in the market. Um, and there are certain ways that you can um, navigate managing the risk of the costs that you're going to expend on visas and recruitment of international workers. Um, and I'd be happy to pick that up with any of you offline, but there are things that you can put in place, addendums to employment contracts, clawback arrangements or employee loans, which might help businesses navigate the cost um, or the risk of the cost uh, to the business. So um, something to bear in mind, you don't necessarily have to pay for everything um, to be able to sponsor someone to come to the UK. So if we go to the next slide, um, what I did want to really focus on, something that's really specific uh, to the construction and engineering sector, is the Home Office's current focus on compliance. So the Home Office, obviously there's a lot of focus in the press around illegal migration, and that extends not only, obviously we hear about the crossings in the channel on the small boats, um, but the Home Office are taking a broader view in terms of immigration enforcement to look at illegal working um, in the workplace. So the Home Office have this year doubled their enforcement team capacity um, to be able to undertake more audits. And not only that, but we are seeing um, an increase in audit inspections because they're no longer waiting to turn up on site to do an in-person visit to come and check your, your immigration and your workforce. But they're doing lots of checks remotely uh, by requesting people to provide documents or by undertaking taking phone interviews. So if you are someone in your organisation that's responsible for recruiting international workers or for HR or compliance, anything to do with people, please do bear this in mind because the Home Office do particularly see the construction sector as high risk. Um, that's generally because the, the number of people working in the industry that the Home Office deem to be lower skilled. 
um, not less, you know, not less vitally skilled as obviously we've seen in the pandemic that keep the keep the UK running. But in terms of skill level, lower skill, the Home Office see that as a higher risk for non-compliance. So something I really wanted to just highlight is that, you know, what we see in particular where the Home Office do turn up on site at construction um, operations is what happens? Do people know how to react and respond? Um, and I've had all sorts of stories for clients and, and organisations where the Home Office have turned up and all of a sudden workers are scattering all over the place, jumping fences um, to try and evade immigration enforcement, even if there's not anything particularly wrong. Um, so it's really worthwhile considering that and thinking about have you got a protocol for what happens if the Home Office arrive on your site unannounced? And actually a key element of that is who do you direct them to in the first instance, because they're going to be there to check documentation and to speak to workers. So what sort of right to work check process do you have? But probably more specific to the construction sector is the challenge of knowing exactly who are your employees on site and who are contractors. And I know this is a very hot topic at the moment from an employment law perspective around worker status and are you an employee or a worker or are you genuinely self-employed? And obviously that brings all sorts of issues around holiday pay and the like, but it will also impact your liability from an immigration perspective. So being really clear about who your employees actually are and who contractors are is really helpful if the Home Office are to turn up at any point unannounced. Now, when I see clients that are approached by immigration enforcement and an audit is undertaken, what are the key issues that we see? So very often, as I say, a lack of right to work checks or that the checks have been done in an inadequate format. So organisations don't have the benefit of a protection against any sort of civil penalties that might be levied against them. We often see quite poor visa expiry tracking. So whether or not they're sponsored workers or somebody's got a family visa, if you can't consistently show that you're tracking visa expiries and making sure people aren't working illegally, the Home Office will take action against you. And then beyond that, um, where we've got large um, corporate organisations and structures, if you're a sponsored um, organisation, so a licensed sponsor of visas for workers in the UK, that comes and brings with it lots of reporting um, and record keeping obligations. And not least, that some of those are where you restructure your business or you, there's any acquisitions or sales or disposals of parts of your organisation. All of that is reportable to the Home Office. So failure to comply with those sorts of requirements are also where we see um, organisations in this sector in particular um, fall foul of the Home Office's expectations. So if we go to the next slide, one thing I did just want to briefly mention is obviously the importance of right to work checks. So that is that before any employee steps foot on site or starts work, before you give them a laptop or a security pass, you must be undertaking a right to work check um, for them in the UK. So um, have they got a British passport? Have they got a visa? Are you doing the check? And I also wanted to flag at this point that for anybody that's not British or Irish, so any other country national, most right to work checks are now digital. So the Home Office are moving to a new online portal system where you can check right to work. And so EU nationals that have got a Brexit or an EU settlement scheme status um, or anybody that you're sponsoring, anybody with a family visa, all those right to work checks are now done digitally. If you haven't got a digital right to work check on file for anybody that you've hired recently, then you won't have a statutory excuse against civil penalty. So it's almost as if you never did a right to work check in the first place. So just something to bear in mind. Um, so you, again, as I say, you don't fall foul of that. And one thing I did want to highlight is that if you are an approved licensed sponsor, where you've got contractors, although contractors are obviously not your employees, and that's important to know the difference, the Home Office do put you under a positive obligation still to be making sure you've got good contractor due diligence in terms of their right to work and their right to be on your site doing the job that they are. So that's something to consider. And then just finally, if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to briefly talk about, um, I'm sorry, the next slide again, what is the policy landscape um, and how are we expecting the, the rules to change for recruitment of international workers going forward? Um, now, two elements here. Obviously, we've just had a new Home Secretary last week. So we are probably going to see a slight change in approach um, from James Cleverly compared to Suella Braverman. But also in the move towards the election, we will be seeing probably a more significant clampdown on immigration to meet the net migration target um, to better position the current government towards their election campaign. Similarly, we're likely to see changes if there's a move to a Labour government in due course or a coalition government um, after an election next year. 
So a couple of things that are on their radar before I wrap up was just to highlight that obviously the current government are very focused on reducing net migration. That means we're likely to see a tightening of rules. So whether or not that means that people will be able to bring family members when they're recruited to move to the UK, something that might seem unimportant because it's not the worker, but obviously people may not be willing to come if they can't bring their families. There was a lot of talk at the political party conferences, which I attended in October, um, an agreement at both the Labour conference and Conservative conference that the current ability to have a lower salary for roles that are in shortage occupation, um, it was agreed across the board that that didn't seem like it was appropriate. So I would expect probably early in the new year that that concession for salaries for shortage occupationless roles will likely be removed because there was consensus across the House in that regard, because there was a sense that paying a lower salary isn't incentivising improved conditions for British workers um, and to improve that skills um, sort of hold, so to speak. Um, and then also there was a lot of concern raised in particular at the Conservative conference around why are we allowing sponsorship of visas for people in trades that we could bring British work, you know, the young people of Britain through into. Um, so plumbing and carpentry, for example, were particularly discussed about whether or not they're suitable for sponsorship. And it may be that the Home Office look to review that and to remove the ability to sponsor in those roles next year. But we haven't heard from the new Home Secretary what um, his opinion is on that. One thing I think we can be very clear on, though, is that visa costs will keep going up because that's a key way that the Home Office um, also make sure they can sustain the immigration system and the other pressures that they have, but also to reduce migration because it makes it unpalatable to sponsor visas. Um, so a few things going on there. It is always changing um, and we do publish alerts on that um, on a regular basis. So um, do look out for those and happy to pick up with anyone offline. But at this point, uh, I'm at time, so I'm going to pass on to Stephen, who's going to do the case law update. Thank you very much, Sasha. That was a fascinating insight on uh, what's a really uh, a hot topic and a, a great forecast too. That appreciate that's difficult with reshuffles and um, you know looming elections and that type of thing. Um, my name's Stephen Williams. I'm a specialist in construction disputes, and this morning I'll be talking to you about three recent uh, interesting cases. And in these cases, I'll be covering uh, concurrent adjudications, i.e., more than one adjudication at any one time, and a pitfall to avoid resisting the enforcement of an adjudicated decision, particularly trying to argue where the dispute was too complex for adjudication. And I'll also be briefly covering payment terms. So if we could go over to the first slide um, on our first adjudication case. Um, so before I get into the details, I'll give you a brief overview on adjudication. Um, I could do a whole slot on it, but um, a whistle stop tour at this stage. Um, adjudication is the most popular way of resolving construction disputes. And this is in part owing to the fact that it's a swift process in, in comparison to court or arbitration proceedings. Its speed means that it's somewhat more rough and ready than court litigation, but in my view, it's fantastic for the industry as it achieves a swift outcome, which breaks deadlocks and allows uh, projects and money to keep moving. So once an adjudicator decides a dispute, the decision can then be enforced at court uh, via a summary process. Now, there are limited grounds to dispute these decisions. Um, one of those is that the adjudicator lacked jurisdiction, which we'll be talking about in this case. Um, adjudication decisions are temporarily binding, so you, you have to respect the result uh, and ultimately pay, subject to any um, you know, def defences such as the adjudicator lacking jurisdiction. Um, if, so even if you're unhappy with the result, um, you can seek a different outcome later at court if you want to litigate on it. So Henry Construction and Alu Fix, um, this case does involve concurrent adjudications. So you'll see on the slide that Alu Fix started a smash and grab adjudication. Um, a smash and grab scenario may arise where one party submits a valid application for payment and the paying party fails to serve a timely valid payment slash pay less notice. That sum applied for in the application for payment um, then becomes due, irrespective of the value of the works. And indeed, that is what happened in the Henry and Ali Fix case. However, before the smash and grab adjudication was concluded, Henry started its own true value adjudication. 
Now, Mr. Malloy, the adjudicator in, in the true value adjudication, um, stayed the adjudication until the notified sum in the smash and grab adjudication was paid. Ultimately, Henry Henry did pay the smash and grab sum, um, and uh, Mr. Malloy started restarted the true value adjudication, and decided that Alu Fix had been overpaid 191,000 uh, pounds in that region plus interest. So um, Henry then decided to try and enforce the adjudicator decision, um, seeking seeking payment of 191k in the way of a an overpayment. Now, if we go over to the next slide, please, we'll see how the court looked at the fact that a true value adjudication had been started before the notified sum had been paid. There was some overlap there. Um, ultimately, the court decided that um, the starting of the true value, true value adjudication before the uh, notified sum had been paid um, was not compliant with the court with the uh, construction act that's because section 111 puts an immediate obligation once the final date for payment has passed uh, on a party to pay the notified sum you are not entitled to start any other adjudication action uh, in relation to the true value until that notified sum has been paid um, this is this is now settled law um, there, there have been a number of cases on it, um, so always proceed with caution with you know, starting multiple adjudications when you've got an outstanding notified sum, because um, ultimately um, Henry, Henry's counsel wasn't able to convince the court um, that there was good reason for um, you know, not applying section 111 of the, of the Construction Act. Um, ultimately, the time when the notified sum becomes due is when the final date for payment has passed. Um, if you don't know what that is, of course, take advice. But before commencing any alternative action, the sum due must be paid. And this follows uh, the principle of pay now and argue later. Um, so had Henry have started that adjudication um, a few days later, um, you know, after, after the notified sum had been paid, um, you know, he, Henry wouldn't have been in that position. So it's one to one to watch out for. Uh, if we can please go over to the next slide. This case demonstrates the difficulty in seeking to resist the enforcement of adjudicators' decision on the basis of the complexity of the dispute and the time constraints involved in the adjudication process. Now Home Group commenced an adjudication uh, following MPS's repudiatory breach of contract. Um, it was a whopping claim in the region of 8.3 million. Now, in the adjudication and indeed during the enforcement process, MPS complained that the adjudicator lacked jurisdiction because the dispute was too large and too complicated for adjudication and MPS um, did not have sufficient time to prepare. Now, this adjudication involved thousands of documents, uh, lengthy expert ev evidence, and Home Group's expert had uh, nine months to prepare its report, and MPS's expert um, had a matter of you know, a couple of weeks, and so he said that it would have, he would have needed at least 10 weeks. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can see how the court uh, treated those arguments. Um, ultimately, the court, didn't take uh, very kindly to those arguments. Um, it started on the principle that any dispute under a construction contract uh, may be referred to adjudication, and that's, in, that's enshrined in law, section 108 of the Construction Act. Um, the course also said that complexity and constraint of time to respond are inherent in the adjudication process and are no bar in themselves to adjudication enforcement. Um, I mean, whilst I Whilst I empathise with the view that adjudication disputes are often complex with very limited time constraints, um, that is very uh, sometimes and um, quite often the nature of adjudication. Construction disputes are complicated and adjudications are always, almost always carried out um, in time constraints. The, the process is designed to deliver swift decisions to break deadlocks. Um, and as you know, as you'll see, the court stressed uh, in the last point that 
in circumstances where the adjudicator has given proper consideration at each stage of these issues and concluded that he or she can render a decision which del delivers broad justice, uh, the court will be reticent to conclude the adjudicator um, lacked jurisdiction. So there's a real emphasis there on the adjudicator being able to do broad justice and keeping that in mind throughout the process. Uh, this is because adjudication favours getting uh, a result quickly rather than getting the right result. So if you disagree with an adjudicator's decision, you can always go to court uh, or arbitration at a later date uh, in order to get a, a final decision. But uh, you know, I reiterate my empathy because as the responding party, sometimes uh, if it's if it's sprung on you, to, so to speak, um, you wouldn't have had all the time to repair, prepare. But the referring party would have um, all the time to prepare in terms of uh, gathering expert evidence. Um, so it's it's one to be very mindful of. And if you are faced with a complex dispute being referred against you, um, engage support as early as possible. Um, if you engage um, somebody that can help you resolve the disputes, um, the more time you'll have to prepare, uh, the more time you'll have to collate evidence, the more time you'll have to uh, get an expert on board. Because once the adjudication is commenced, time is severely limited. So um, start early. Uh, and with that, I'd like to go over to the next slide, please. The case of uh, Lidl and um, Free CL, as they were trading as, um, is all around uh, payment payment terms. So Lidl engaged Free CL, um, a refrigeration and air conditioning contractor, under a, a framework agreement. Um, that agreement included provisions for interim payments uh, after certain milestones were achieved, which is um, fairly standard. Now, um, the part that does raise the red flag is that the final date for payment was to be calculated with reference to the uh, date free CL uh, provided a VAT invoice. Um, this is this is a red flag. Some of you may know why, but we'll come on to it. Um, so free CL made an application for payment in the sum of uh, 178, uh, 100, uh, 781,000 uh, pounds. Little valued it at nil on the basis that the final date hadn't been fixed because a VAT invoice hadn't been provided. So the adjudicator subsequently awarded the, the sum claimed um, and FreeCL tried to enforce the adjudicator's um, decision. Uh, Lidl saw all sorts of declarations regarding the payment provisions. Uh, it was trying to argue that, trying to get the court to declare that um, the provision regarding um, the final date for payment being calculated by reference to the provision of a VAT invoice was valid. If it was found to be valid by the court, it would have, um, it would have essentially nullified the adjudicator's decision. So let's see what the court said on the, uh, on the award for the um, declaration, deciding the declaration. Um, the court said that the payment provision must, uh, the final date for payment being conditional upon any other event other than the due date is invalid. So don't, let, don't link your final date to anything else other than due, due, your due date. Um, it, it, it won't work, it will be invalid and um, you'll run in all, all sorts of problems. Um, so the court also said the Construction Act was intended to introduce a blanket prohibition on party autonomy as regards to uh, the ascertainment of the final date for payment, save as to the length of the period. So you can specify how long between the due date and the final payment, um, but um, your final date must always link back to your due date, nothing else. Um, and I, I think I can't be any clearer than that. That's the court's very clear view. Um, I, the, the key takeaway from this case is that it ensure your payment terms are compliant with the Construction Act. And um, that's something that we can assist you with. Um, and with that, that concludes my slot. So thank you very much for listening, folks. And I'll hand you back now to our esteemed uh, leader, Stefan, to take uh, to lead the Q&A session. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Stephen. And thanks to um, Sasha and Emma as well. We're all back now in panel format and we've had some questions coming in which is great so thank you very much for those. So 
we've got 10 minutes left and that gives us to work through some of these questions so Stephen I'll give you a, your voice a rest um, Emma perhaps if I come to you first a question here uh, which is please can you clarify the definition of a high-risk building Yes, so um, as I mentioned, in general terms, it's um, 18 metres or more, seven storeys or more, and more than one residential dwelling. Um, there's a couple of nuances around that, and I think probably that's what the person's alluding to. But there's, um, in the design and construction context, um, it's a slightly different definition to the occupation phase. Um, and obviously, design and construction is what we're focusing on, but the main point to be aware of is that the definition includes care homes and hospitals for construction, but in the occupation phase, um, those buildings are excluded. Incidentally, I'd, I'd note that hotels and barracks are excluded um, in both contexts. Contexts. So. Good stuff. Thank you, Emma. Okay, moving on, Sasha. If I come to you, question around visa sponsorship, which is, what alternatives are there to visa sponsorship? And linked to that, can workers get their own visas? Um. Yeah. So there's, in essence, very limited alternative options to um, a sponsored work visa. Um, whenever someone comes to me, I mean, the first question we will always ask to avoid going through a sponsored visa route is to look at elements to do with their personal lives. So it's worth us looking at someone's history of, of sort of heritage, their ancestry, um, depending on their nationality. Um, so sometimes there's a visa route available there or looking at their family members. So if they've got someone they could get a spouse visa in connection to, for example, or any other sort of family visa, then we will always look at those first. And then there are also sometimes some unsponsored routes, typically for younger people. So um, what we call a high potential individual or a graduate visa for those that have just completed um, university degrees. So they may have an ability to be um, to work without sponsorship, but they're going to be very time limited. So maybe two years, really. Um, so even if the, at the outset is a way to bring them on board without sponsoring a visa longer term, they're likely to need to move on to sponsorship in any event. Um, but other than that, uh, anyone who's not got the benefit of youth <laughs> or a recent graduate, then sadly, no, largely um, a sponsored visa is the only way forward. Good stuff. Thank you, Sasha. Stephen, um, question here on adjudication. Can you ever commence a true value adjudication before a smash and grab adjudication has been concluded? So as we saw in the Henry case, it's it's established law that one cannot start a true value adjudication until the notified sum has been paid. Otherwise, your adjudicator will end up uh, lacking jurisdiction and the court won't enforce um, on that basis. So your decision won't be worth the paper it's written on. Um, however, the, the Henry case did envisage that concurrent adjudications in, in that context might be permissible um, in a smash and grab context. For instance, where the smash and grab adjudication hinges on whether a pay less notice uh, um, valuing the works at nil is valid. Um, if it isn't valid, that obviously the smash and grab, grab will succeed. Um, and and if, if it is, uh, it won't succeed um, because it will be, you know, that there'll be a valid um, payment notice in place. Um, so it, it's, it's risky um because if that payment if that pay less notice is found to be valid um uh, sorry if not found to be valid you'll you'll later risk your adjudication uh, decision not being enforceable so each case case defends on its own facts so uh, in all instances um proceed with caution and take advice good stuff thank you stephen um emma if i come back to you a question here from a main contractor about force majeure so and inflation. Uh, the question is, can extraordinary inflation ever be classed as a force majeure event? And how can you recover if your contract is silent on the subject of inflation? Um, I'd say certainly under English law, it's it's very difficult because the, 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 the case law explains what a force majeure event is. And it's very, very hard to to have a force majeure event certainly anything like inflation wouldn't generally be be classed as a force majeure event it may be that you've got a definition in your contract written into it of what force majeure means which 
might on the off chance be drafted really widely, but I would suspect it wouldn't be drafted widely enough to include inflation. So really you've got to look at other commercial ways out of that contract. Um, you know, there may be an opportunity to renegotiate rates um, for the future, bearing in mind the ongoing relationship, for example. Good stuff, thank you, Emma. Uh, Sasha, back to you. What are the most common problems in getting visas issued and what are the refusal rates? Um, so refusal mm. rates for sponsored work visas are actually incredibly low, um, which is one of the nice things about the UK immigration system that we don't have a system whereby someone has to attend an interview and it's, you know, if your face fits and someone takes a liking to you. So actually, as long as you can tick a box and meet the criteria, then actually largely um, the visa approval rate is incredibly high, which is really reassuring for anyone engaging in the process and spending that much money on a visa process. Um, common issues that we see, um, well, probably what I see more in the sector is occasionally um, some of the workforce might have, um, you know, instances where they've had slapped wrists from the police, even if they were quite minor in caution. So sometimes they have to be declared, but it doesn't mean it will be fatal to a visa application. So I have seen that perhaps um, in some industries more than others. Um, and then the other thing we see is not that it's going to lead to refusal, but certain nationalities, the visa process takes an awful lot longer. And that will be largely due to um, the Home Office's security profiling of certain country nationalities. So, for example, at the current time, visa processing for Russian and Chinese nationals is slower. Um, but that doesn't mean to say they'll be refused. It's just that they take longer to go through. But um, it's something to bear in mind in terms of um, thinking about your onboarding. Great stuff. Thanks, Sasha. Uh, time for a couple more. Uh, Stephen, back to you, if I may. Another question on adjudication, which is, are any construction disputes unsuitable for adjudication? Um, so uh, construction disputes are often complex and, you know, it's inherently um, constrained by time because they're, you know, it's a swift process. Um, so there will be some disputes that are not suitable. Um, but earlier I discussed a case that was over nine million and um, very complicated, a massive amount of documents, and that was deemed suitable by the court. Um, but from the adjudicator's perspective, the case law is clear that what the adjudicator needs to be satisfied with is that he or she can do broad justice to the parties. Um, so keep that in mind throughout. But from the referring party's perspective, deciding is this case suitable um, really depends on your strategy. Um, for instance, if you're if you're bringing a tortious claim where there is no contract, um, there will be no right to adjudicate because it's a tortious claim. It's not under a construction contract. Or if you're looking to bring a dispute against multiple parties, you won't be able to do that in adjudication. Um, so it really does to depend on your strategy. And you, you may need all of the steps in the court process, such as um, the disclosure and, and wit the formal witness statements, that sort of thing, in order to resolve the case. Um, and in that way, um, uh, uh, adjudication might be unsuitable, or rather um, litigation or arbitration may be more suitable. Very good. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Well, we're conscious, I'm conscious of time and we're coming up to midday. So um, that's just about all we've got time for. Um, I hope you found uh, this morning's session useful and informative. Um, when the session ends, you'll be invited to submit your feedback and that includes an opportunity to put forward um, things that you might want to hear about from the CICES or indeed from us um, on, on future sessions. So if you're able to take a minute to complete that exercise, uh, we always find that extremely helpful. Um, and looking ahead, we're in the process of finalising the dates for our 2024 webinar series and hopefully we'll be invited back by the CICES to join join you once again. And uh, so please do look out um, on the CICES website and other um, platforms for future events. Um, so all that remains for me to say is thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you to the CICES team for inviting us to speak to you this morning. Uh, have a good day and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.